Good morning. Let's go ahead and stand together. Lord, we are so thankful that you come to make us new. And Father, we just acknowledge that we stand in the presence of a holy God this morning. Lord, we're so thankful for your love that pursued us to the cross, Lord, that you laid your life down for us and that you rose again, Father, that we could have that fellowship and that communion with you. Lord, we thank you that you tore the veil so that we could come to you, Lord. And Father, may we just come this morning just in awe of you and who you are.
so thankful for your love and what that means for us, God. To sing this one out together. I know you guys know this one. It says, The Splendor of the King.
thank you for your presence this morning. God, we're so thankful for who you are. Lord, that you love us the way that we are. God, that we can walk in here so far from you. Lord, all you want to do is show us your love. And so, Lord, we pray that your love would lead us to repentance, God. Lord, that we would want to walk in purity and in holiness before a holy God. Lord, we offer you this morning, we give you our hearts and ask that you would speak to us through your word. We thank you, we love you, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, guys, please turn around and try to find somebody new this morning and introduce yourself. Good morning and welcome. So glad you could join us for this first service. Hey, just a couple of quick announcements before we begin um, our Bible study. This morning we're going to be looking at Acts, or Acts, we're not in the book of Acts. In my mind, I'm thinking about the book of Acts, but we're in the book of Matthew, chapter 27. And we're going to be looking at verses 57 through 66 in a message I'm entitling, The King's Grave. <clears throat> but just a couple of quick notes before we get into uh, the message this morning. There's an Ireland's missions coming up. Calvary's going to be uh, doing a service trip to Ireland. And um, they're going to be serving the churches of Ireland in whatever way possible. Um, you can sign up at the, uh, at the Connect Center if you're interested in going, and so you can fill out an application. They're going to limit the um, amount of people, so you want to sign up soon and, and be in prayer. Also, we're looking for more volunteers to help with the cleaning ministry. We currently have uh, four. We need about six more, and again, if you're interested, you can uh, sign up at the Connect Center, and those people who are serving, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Also, the cafe is looking for volunteers to serve once a month in the second service. They also need baristas. I guess barista is a fancy way of saying people who will actually pour the coffee into the cup. I think it's actually even a little more complicated. They want you to learn how to make stuff as well. So don't be intimidated by that. These guys know what they're doing. Also, the women's discipleship team is going to be hosting their second annual uh, Retreat entitled Crisis of Faith, uh, Seeing God's Hand in Adversity. Space is limited, so again, if you're interested, in, you can sign up at the Connect Center. Also, remember to turn off your cell phones unless you're using them as a Bible. If you're using them as a Bible, then use them as a Bible. If you're using your Bible as a Bible, that's okay too. There are agape boxes around the sanctuary. They're there for your tithes, your offerings, your praise reports, your prep. Um, prayer requests. Also, we have text to give. More and more of you are utilizing it, and so if that's a convenient way for you to, to minister and to worship, then you can dial 720-608-4072. That's 720-608-4072. Um, also, cry room, family room, you can stop by the cafe uh, to enjoy a fresh brewed cup of coffee. And again, having said all of that, Matthew chapter 27, verses 57 through 66. This morning we're talking about the king's grave. I could just as easily have called this how we respond to death. Matthew chapter 27, verses 57 through 66. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, our hearts are broken over those many families that are suffering grief. Lord, we live in a fallen world and we live in a broken world. And Lord, we also know that if we live long enough, we are going to find an opportunity where we're going to have to bury someone that we love. Lord, in 
this broken world, we would hope that <laughs> parents don't have to bury their children, but rather children can bury their parents. But Lord, we know that often things don't work out the way that we had hoped. And so our hearts again pray specifically for people who have suffered loss, who are grieving. Lord, I pray that you would provide comfort, support. Lord, we also pray for that person who finds himself or herself a little bit distant from you. Lord, we pray that this morning that they would open their hearts. Lord, we pray that they would come out of the shadows and into the light. That, Lord, with confidence they would love you and serve you and walk with you. So, Lord, we commit this time to you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 27 Beginning in verse 57. Now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb which he had hewn out of the rock and he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed and Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb on the next day which followed the day of preparation the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate saying sir we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said after three days I will rise therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people he's risen from the dead so the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go your way. Make it secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone, setting the guard. In Matthew chapter 27, we've seen Judas overcome with guilt, hang himself in verses 3 through 10. Jesus then appears before Pilate, the Roman governor, in verses 1 and 2 and 11 through 26. Pilate finds Jesus innocent, but caves into the demands of the religious leaders and sentences Jesus to death. In the chapter, we walked with Simon the Cyrene as he carried the cross in verses 32 and 33. The cup at the cross, verse 34. The citation over the cross in verse 37. The criminals on either side of the cross in verse 38. The contempt of the crowds as Jesus hung on the cross in verses 39 through 44. We saw a cloud cover the cross in verse 45 and then a cry from the cross as Jesus dismisses his spirit in verse 50. The Lord Jesus dies on Calvary's cross saving the entire world from sin once and for all. And in this passage we're given several different reactions to the death of Jesus. The real question is, how are you going to react? How are you going to react to death? And more specifically, how are you going to react to the death of Jesus? In this passage, we see a tomb given in verses 57 through 61. A tomb guarded in verses 62 through 66. In this passage, a secret follower is going to finally go public. 
Like I prayed earlier, he's going to come out of the shadows. He's going to come into the light. He's no longer going to worry about keeping his friendship and his fellowship and his relationship with Jesus a secret. He's going to come out of the closet. Certain women are going to remain steadfast in their love and loyalty. The enemies of Jesus are also going to face real challenges. How do you make sure the person that you want dead stays dead? And perhaps the greatest irony in all of human history, the critics, the skeptics, the enemies of Jesus entertained and then embraced the notion, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said he was going to rise from the grave. But they didn't believe it, even for a minute. They didn't even for a minute think that he would actually defeat death and rise from the grave. But they did believe that the disciples might use the words of Jesus as an excuse to steal the body, fabricate a story that Jesus rose from the dead, and then create this charade, invent a religion. That Jesus is God's Messiah. And what you see in part is that evil men will often project their evil motives onto people who are hurt and in pain. The death of Jesus is going to prompt Joseph to go public. The death of Jesus is going to provoke certain women to love and loyalty. The death of Jesus is going to persuade his enemies to take countermeasures to prevent any further threat to their deeply held beliefs, however wrong they are, however deceived they are. And so we begin with the king's secret disciple. Look at verse 57. Now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had become a disciple of Jesus. Pause. No one really planned for his death that day, except God. This was an unwelcome funeral. This was an unplanned death. The Lord Jesus had hung on the cross, you'll remember, from 9 o'clock in the morning till 12 o'clock noon. At that time, a thick envelope of darkness descended on the earth from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock. After Jesus bore our sin, he died. An earthquake rocked Jerusalem. His lifeless body hung on the cross. Roman soldiers broke the legs of the thieves who were on either side, to the left and to the right. The sun was beginning to to set. Evening was fast making its approach. This is the time shortly after 3 o'clock, but before the sun goes down, the soldiers inspect the body of Jesus to make sure that he's dead. One soldier will pierce his side with a large Roman spear called a pilum. He will slip the blade underneath his rib cage, piercing the percardial sac, and John will witness water and blood come from the wound. The women will watch. John the Apostle will watch. Almost certainly Joseph of Arimathea will watch. And again, no one is prepared for a funeral that day. And it's sometimes difficult because death sometimes comes when we least expect it. In the most unwelcome way. Joseph Bailey in his book, The View from a Hearse, tells a story as he tries to offer hope to a woman whose small son is dying. I can relate to this story because I had a similar instance happen to me. He writes, quote, It's good to know, isn't it? I spoke slowly, 
choosing my words with unusual care, even though the medical outlook is hopeless, we can hope for our children in such a situation. We can be sure that, our, that if our child dies, he'll be removed from sickness and suffering and everything like that, and he'll be completely well and happy, unquote. If I could only believe that, the woman replied, but I don't. When he dies, I'll just have to cover him with dirt and forget that I ever had him. Unquote. Can you imagine anything more sad? Can you imagine anything more tragic? But Often this woman's words express the hopeless plight of so many people around us who struggle with the idea what really, what really happens when you die. Mozart was buried in a pauper's grave at the age of 35. No one came. Bad weather forced everyone home. Alexander the Great insisted at his funeral that his hands be unbound, that they be empty, and that they be open. The young emperor of the world, possessor of countless treasures, dies with nothing in his hands. The Bible says it's appointed once for a person to die. The religious leaders had hoped that the body of Jesus would be thrown into a trash heap and burned or eaten by wild dogs. Scavengers haunted the trash heaps in the valley that, that stood on the side just on the opposite end of, of the, the western portion of, of the Temple Mount. The Roman government didn't care what happened to the body. The women hoped that death would come quickly so that they could prepare the body for, for burial. But here's the problem. Where would they take him? They had no place to take him. They hadn't prepared a place to take him. But God prepared a place. God moved on the heart of one Joseph of Arimathea to come forward, to step forward and to do what's right. He had prepared a place to bury his son. And in fulfillment of the scripture, the prophet Isaiah had written in Isaiah 53, 9, quote, And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Was Joseph of Arimathea familiar with the writings of Isaiah? I'm certain that he was. Did he think that God would use him in this most special way to fulfill that particular prophecy? Perhaps only in hindsight. Jesus fulfills prophecy in his life, in his death but also in his burial. We only have a sketchy detail of this man, Joseph of Arimathea, like the other Joseph in the Bible. The one who attended Mary at the birth of Jesus were given only limited information. In Mark chapter 15, verse 43, we read, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God coming and taking courage, went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Arimathea is a town that's about 22 miles north and a little west of Jerusalem. Its ancient name is Ramah Taim. It was the birthplace of Samuel the prophet in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. And so he is from Ramat Taim, so he was called Yosef Aramatia, the man from Aramatia or from Ramat Taim. We understand that he's a prominent council member, which means that he was a member of the ruling elite. He was a member of that group, that legislative body that you and I know as the Sanhedrin. 
And the fact that he's described as waiting for the kingdom of God means that he had a real hope of spiritual renewal and national and maybe even personal repentance. The good Dr. Luke describes Joseph as, quote, a good and upright man in chapter 23, verse 50. John's gospel says that Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews in chapter 19, verse 38. And so it's not lost on me that at the moment that Jesus was born, there was a man named Joseph that God assigned to protect him. And at the moment of his death, there was a man named Joseph who was assigned to minister to him and provide a burial for him. It also isn't lost on me that when he's born, he's born in a cave. What you and I would call a manger, but almost certainly in Bethlehem, it was a hollowed out piece of rock where he was born. And now he's going to be placed in yet another hollowed out rock. The death of Jesus is going to bring Joseph from a journey of cowardice to courage, from secrecy to openness. Was Joseph present at the trial of Jesus? Some people say yes. Some people say no. In Luke chapter 23, verse 51, it says, He had not consented to their decision and deed. Some suggest, did he not consent to their decision and deed because he wasn't there and he was unavailable to consent? Or was he there and protesting the event? The Roman soldiers feared greatly. You'll remember in the passage that's earlier, you'll remember I told you about this, these Roman soldiers see the darkness. There's the earthquake. The soldier confesses that Jesus is the Son of God. In that particular passage, we discovered something that sometimes fear can be the first step towards faith. Joseph begins his journey afraid. Sometimes when people are governed by fear, they're referred to counselors for treatment. Sometimes when people's mind and heart and circumstances seem to be surrounded by fear, they sometimes think that it's a physiological problem or, an, or a mental and emotional problem, but sometimes the problem is a spiritual problem. Sometimes it's a problem that is taking place not just simply in the mind, but in the heart and in the soul. And we discover something right away. When we turn to Jesus, our fear, even though it starts off as fear, can sometimes make the journey to faith because the real antidote to fear is faith in Jesus. And this is why the Bible says that perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. The Life Application Bible Commentary says, quote, our fears about death, suffering, loss, tragedy, illness, even about tough decisions have one important starting point if we hope to overcome them. Jesus. Jesus is the starting point. Let faith in him displace any fear that you might have. Some of you might be struggling. A very private struggle about what's going to happen, about what's going to happen in your future. And it's important that you remember something, that no matter how fearful the present, that you can place your confidence in Jesus. In verse 58, it says, This man went to Pilate, and he asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. Now, this is interesting because Joseph is going to use his privilege and his access to take bold steps to ask for the body of Jesus. 
the moment that he does this, he's going to go on record as a follower of Jesus, a lover of Jesus, a Jesus sympathizer. The Lord Jesus had died just a few hours before sundown, and the Sabbath is beginning to make its way as the day is beginning to fade, and the law forbade travel on the Sabbath. Remember, this is the day before the, it's the day of preparation and the day before the Sabbath. So work is forbidden on the Sabbath. Travel is forbidden on the Sabbath. But according to the Jewish sensibilities also, if you touch a dead body, it renders one unclean. And so Joseph understands that by doing this particular thing, he is going to also make himself ineligible to participate in the Passover the following day. It would appear that only Pilate had the authority to release the, bo the body. And so again, it isn't like, you know, whoever wants dibs on the body can have it. Apparently, unless you get this release, a legitimate release, an, an authorized release, um, that the Roman soldiers could have really prevented you from doing so. And note the time. Even though you'll note that it's after 3 o'clock, and this may not mean a whole lot to you, but this means business hours are closed. Pilate has shut the door. He's not available for audiences. And so Joseph is going to go when access to the governor would have been severely restricted. And even though it's severely restricted, he is going to do, go and he's going to make appeal. And both Pilate and the Sanhedrin will know that Joseph, again, is out of the closet and out into the open. And Joseph is going to be identified with what looks to the Roman and the Jewish leaders as being involved in a false and a failed Messiah. The dream is over. The depression and the despair must have been overwhelming for the faithful followers of Jesus. And by the way, what would have happened if the Romans had taken down the body? What if they had stripped it? And what if they disposed of it? I'm going to suggest to you it was necessary that the Jews be able to confirm his death. And it was necessary to be able to confirm his burial. It was going to be necessary to provide, if you will, a chain of custody as we are going to understand when we get to chapter 28. How do I know? How do I know? How do I really know that Jesus really died on that cross, that he was really buried, and that he really came back to life? It's all going to make sense to you in just in the next few weeks. And you'll remember in verse 59, when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. Picture it. The sun is setting. Joseph is rushed. We know that Joseph has help from at least one other person, Nicodemus. It's recorded in John chapter 19, verses 38 through 42, where this same Nicodemus who we are introduced to in John chapter 3 shows up, and according to verse 39 of John chapter 19, he comes out of hiding. He provides about 100 pounds of spices, and the picture is that these two religious leaders struggle to remove the body of Jesus from the cross. They have to remove the ugly nails. They have to cut the ropes. They have to gently take his bound body from the cross. And look in verse 59 when it says, when Joseph had taken the body. It's not the normal word for body. The normal word for body in the Greek language is soma. The word that Matthew uses here is the word that you and I would use for corpse. You know what that word means. When I use the term corpse, it's a word that indicates there is no life left. Scholars suggest that no mourning was permitted for those 
executed under Roman law. And I was hard pressed to try and find proof or substantiation of that claim. I am unconvinced that even the Roman soldiers could force the women to stop crying and force the people around them to stop sobbing. There are certain things that happen in our life that, that other people can't be in charge of. The gaping wounds must have left puddles of blood on their robes. And Nicodemus and Joseph almost certainly had his blood smeared on them. His body is gently, carefully removed from the cross, and then it is taken down and it is washed and then cleansed with water. The Lord Jesus was wrapped in a clean linen cloth. There's much that people have made of what's called the Shroud of Turin. There's believers and there's skeptics. I myself fall into the skeptical camp. But maybe the person who knows the most about the resurrection in the whole wide world is my friend Gary Habermas, who's spoken from this very platform and this very pulpit. The leading expert in the world on the subject of the resurrection is not completely unconvinced he leans toward the idea that the shroud may in fact be a legitimate object. What is more telling to me is that Jesus is wrapped with a clean cloth. And again, we see an image. He begins his life in a cave wrapped in swaddling clothes. A clean linen cloth. He is going to end his life in a cave wrapped in a clean linen cloth. And again, it's interesting to note that from this time forward, as you're reading the text and you're examining what's happening, this is the last time that an enemy will ever touch him. No one who hates him, no one who despises him, no one who doesn't believe in him will ever touch him ever again from this moment forward. Now, this becomes important to you, especially if you want to touch him in the not-too-distant future. And again, Joseph handles the dead body of Jesus along with Nicodemus. In verse 60, it says, And laid it in his new tomb, which had been hewn out of solid rock or had been hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. Now, in verse 60 where it says, the tomb was new. It's interesting in the original language, it's the Greek word kainos. It means new in the sense that it's never been used ever before. And so here it means never used. This is, this is a freshly dug grave. No one has ever been placed in this before. This isn't a family crypt that other people have, 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 had lain in earlier. The tomb is hewn. That is, it's cut from solid rock. And there's Jerusalem limestone that surrounds the sacred city. If you are on the Temple Mount, you'll notice that there's rock outcroppings to the north, the south, and the east, and the west. And there are limestone deposits that literally go from north to south throughout the land. Jesus, again, born in a cave in Bethlehem, buried in a cave in Jerusalem. And this is Joseph's memorial in stone. Joseph is going to lay in the grave Jesus is going to lay in the grave that Joseph had set aside for himself. And, and that's the idea. And, and again, this is interesting to me too, because the word for tomb in the original language is a word that's very different. It isn't like when we use the term headstone, you know immediately what I mean. This word is a word that means more like monument. 
The monument was hewn from solid rock. This is, this is a, a part of the point that's being made. He is wealthy. The, 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 it's made from solid rock. It was meant to say something about the person who's buried inside. It, you've all heard of a pauper's grave, or you've all heard of an unmarked grave, and you've all heard of these vast memorials where important people are buried, and this particular tomb would have been one that would have been noted for its splendor. Joseph, when he had this tomb made in Jerusalem, it was meant to make a statement. It was meant to make a statement about himself, about his family, about the contribution that he made to the, to the world. It was meant to say, look at how rich that I am, that I can be buried in this kind of splendor. I remember visiting a, a place in Texas where a guy collected Lincoln Continentals. He had Lincoln Continentals from, I think, 1953 to forward to into the 1970s. And in his collection was the Lincoln Continental that was right behind President Kennedy's Lincoln Continental when he was assassinated. And he wanted to be buried in this Lincoln Continental. He wanted, they wanted to dig a hole big enough to put him in the car and then put him in the ground. It's kind of a waste. But here's the point. He is making the statement that I was supposed to be buried there, but now Joseph has changed his plans. Again, it begs yet another question. Is Joseph in his mind and heart thinking, I'm just, this is a loner. Jesus is going to rise in, in a couple of days and, I, you know, I'll have my grave back. I doubt that that's what's happening. I suspect that he thinks that his plans have changed. That whatever else is happening in his life, the memorial that he had set aside for himself is now going to be used for the glory of God and the glory of Jesus. It becomes a, a, something that we should think about as Christians. When we identify with Jesus, when we identify with his life, when we identify with his death, when we identify with his burial, when we most certainly identify with his resurrection... There's something that should be happening inside of your head and your heart. You have a change of plans. Your plans have now changed for the future. Your life is going to be a different life. Your future is going to be a different future. Whatever we planned for our life, that's changed. Whatever we planned for our death, that's changed. Joseph is no longer interested in his glory. It's his desire that Jesus never be forgotten. Some of you understand that, especially if you've lost someone that you love dearly. Most particularly, if it's a tragic death, if, if it's a premature death, you don't want the world to forget the person that you loved so much. Let me ask you a question. Is that your desire? Is it your desire that Jesus be glorified in your life and in your death and in your future? Are you building a future where you'll be remembered or where Jesus will be remembered? Have you included Jesus in your funeral arrangements? By the way, Jesus is going to be remembered. The issue isn't whether or not Jesus is going to be remembered. The issue really is going to be, will he be remembered in you? Is that going to be the first thought that comes into the person's mind as they get ready to prepare you for burial, as they make the funeral arrangements, is the first thing that they're going to say is, he loved the Lord, she loved the Lord. We know 
that the tomb was large enough to walk into from John chapter 20, verse 6. One more thing. Seventy members of the Sanhedrin. How many of their names do you remember? I'm going to guess if you're a smart Bible student, you go, I remember Caiaphas. He was a member, he was a member of the 70. I remember Joseph. I remember Nicodemus. The possibility that Paul at some point later in his life is a member of the Sanhedrin. But you'll notice that their memory is all in direct proportion to their relationship with Christ. How will you be remembered? A wealthy person could afford an elaborate tomb with channeled grooves and a large stone. A wealthy person could afford that kind of tomb. The stone, by the way, would have been placed slightly elevated above the entryway to make it easy to roll it in front of the opening, but difficult to roll it back. And being wrapped in fine linen meant that his burial wasn't just quick, but that it was honorable. Being buried in his new tomb was a According to the IVP Bible background, Craig Keener, he says it was a special act of reverence and an act of affection. I like that. I've told you stories about funerals that I've done. I remember one story in particular where we we're at the funeral home and, and the widow's trying to pick out the casket for her departed husband. And, I mean, these caskets are ranged in price from $12,000 to $10,000 to $8,000, $4,000. And, and the widow looked at the funeral director and said, if I knew it was this much money, I would have made the old man make his own casket. <laughs> she, yeah, I laughed too, and they laughed. But the, the point is that it was an elaborate funeral. It was a gracious funeral. Now, Joseph enters the scene and then he exits the scene just as quickly as he comes in to the story of Jesus. But in this brief moment, he does all that he can to further the plans of God and the ministry of Jesus. And that's the point. At risk to himself, his prestige and his status, he's going to go on record as a Christ follower. Joseph used to be afraid, but now he's not afraid anymore. G.K. Chesterton says, quote, courage is almost a contradiction in terms. It means a strong desire to live, taking the form of a readiness to die, unquote. And that's exactly right. It's at this moment. It's at this moment where fear confronts courage that he makes this decision that he doesn't care anymore what people think. He doesn't care about the Roman authorities. He doesn't care about his peers. He doesn't care about his reputation. He doesn't care about anything other than to demonstrate his affection for Jesus. And sometimes that's exactly what it's going to take for you to come out of the closet and to go on record as a person who knows him and loves him and serves him. So many people will say, my faith is a very private thing. I get that. But is your affection and your commitment to Jesus evident? Joseph's reputation is, is not what matters anymore at this point. Jesus matters. And then we look at the king's steadfast disciples. Look what it says in verse 61. And Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. Two of the women followed Joseph and Nicodemus. They're removing the body from the burial site. They're walking to the place of the burial site. Both women are present. 
at the cross. They are present at his death. And now they're going to be present at his funeral. The Life Application Bible has a wonderful note on this verse. It says that these women could do very little. They couldn't speak before the Sanhedrin in Jesus' defense. They couldn't appeal to Pilate. They couldn't stand against the crowds. They couldn't overpower the Roman guards. They didn't even have a place to bury him. But they did what they could. They stayed at the cross when everyone else fled. They followed Jesus' body to the tomb. They prepared spices to mask the stench of death that you're going to see in Matthew chapter 28, verse 1, as Mary Magdalene is going to return. Because they used the opportunities available to them, they will become the first witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. And as believers, we shouldn't be upset about what we can't do but rather what what we can do you don't have to agonize even for one more day about what you can't do for Jesus all you need to do is just simply embrace the notion what can I do Lord, who am I and what resources have you given to me that I can communicate my love, my concern, my commitment to the lordship of Jesus? God blessed their devotion and their diligence. God blessed their faithfulness and their steadfast love. And the Lord will do the same for you. The Lord will do exactly the same thing for you. Mary Magdalene was there. And I wonder if she remembered her demons. I wonder if she remembered how Jesus delivered her from her private hell. What were these women thinking? They'll witness his removal from the cross. They'll walk with Joseph and Nicodemus to the burial site. They'll return and serve as witnesses to the massive stone's removal and the empty grave. They'll return and serve as witnesses. And Bible scholars have made a very big deal out of the fact that if you're going to fabricate a story of somebody coming back to life, that you're not going to literally use women in the narrative if you are trying to to make it believable and credible. The reason why the New Testament says it, it's because it's exactly what happened. What role will you play in the story of Jesus? Your ministry may not include headlines. It may not include books. It may not include crowds. It may not include drama. It may not include radio or television or a made-for-TV movie. Sometimes our work for Jesus may seem routine. It may seem uneventful. But sometimes just being present at life's most difficult moment and death's most awkward moment gives glory to God and gives comfort to the saints. When your life flashes before your eyes, it's good to know that one of those memories is the person who's standing by the bedside, by the hospital side, You have to understand something, that your presence in people in pain is never wasted. Your prayers are never wasted. I remember talking to one lady in our church who is getting ready, was getting ready to, 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 to accompany her mother as she lies dying in the hospital and she's overcome with grief and she's overcome with sorrow and, and it's so difficult to be by her mother's side but she knows that she needs to be there and I remember saying something to her your mother has taught you so much She's been with you at every moment in your life from the time that she gave birth to you. She's the person who fed you. She's the person who cared for you. She's the person who loved you your whole life. She has one more lesson that she has to impart to you. She wants to show you what it's like to die 
when you love Jesus, when you are a Jesus lover, when you are a Jesus follower, what will you do for Jesus? What if there's no stage? What if there's no audience? Do you think that the two Marys and the two wealthy followers of Jesus were thinking about becoming New Testament stars? Do you think that they go, hey, you know what? This is going to land us a role in the passion. That's actually not what they're thinking. Even though this is the greatest story ever told. And you may not know the role that God has assigned for you. These are some of the things that we can learn from these faithful followers. There's some controversy over the location of the tomb. This last time that we went to Israel, obviously there's two primary places that people talk about the location of the tomb, whether it's the, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher or wh whether it's Gordon's tomb. I, I don't have time to get into the details of the location of the tomb. But I do have time to get into these details. The two Marys know exactly the true location of the true tomb. The two council members know exactly the location. The religious leaders who have to persuade Pilate to execute the renegade rabbi, they also have to find out the true location of the tomb. Look at this. In verse 62, the king's staunch detractors. In verse 62, it says, On the next day which followed the day of preparation. Think about it. Friday, over with. It's the day of preparation. The chief priests, the Pharisees, gathered together to Pilate on their high holy day of Passover. These observant Jews find themselves in front of the Roman governor saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, He's risen from the dead, so the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard Go your way, make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Now remember, the next day, the religious leaders form a delegation. They present themselves to Pilate. Jesus is dead. Jesus has been buried. Now they want to make sure That what dies in Jerusalem stays dead in Jerusalem. They want to make sure that he stays buried. I want you to think about what you're reading. At least one Passover was spent by the Jewish leaders at Christ's tomb. In other words, they spent their Passover to make sure that the tomb was sealed to make sure that the tomb was secure. This is on the Sabbath day. Could there be an argument made that they're breaking the Sabbath? I think that an argument could be made that they're breaking the Sabbath. But this, from the person that they accused consistently of breaking the Sabbath. Now again, there are lessons from the faithless as well. The religious leaders admit that Jesus claims that he's going to come back to life. They said it. Did Jesus say, I'm going to come back to life? Am I going to rise from the dead? Matthew 16, 21. Matthew 17, 9. Matthew 20, 19. They're not misquoting Jesus. Jesus does say he's going to come back to life. But by the way, where did the religious leaders get such a notion? Where are the religious leaders in Matthew chapter 16, in Matthew chapter 17, in Matthew chapter 20? Where are they hearing this information? What if I suggested to you that when Judas went to betray him, that he told them, this guy thinks he's going to come back to life. He told us repeatedly that he's going to be killed and that he's going to come back to life. Did Judas tell them 
They don't think even for a moment that, he's, that this is possible. But they do think that the disciples of Jesus might feed the fantasy of their dead friend and steal his body and make claims that he had risen from the dead. Their words, so the last deception will be worse than the first. What's the first deception? That he's the king? That he's God's Messiah? That he is the fulfillment of the prophecies that was meant for them? What could be more crazy than the outlandish claims that Jesus is God's Messiah, that he is God's son, that he came from heaven. In their worldview, it's that people might believe that. Now think for a moment. Where are the disciples? Scared out of their wits. Where are they? Fearful. Where are they? Hiding in their despair and in their grief, do you think that the thing that they're thinking about is Jesus is coming back to life? That's absolutely not what they're thinking. And this is interesting. What the disciples of Jesus had forgotten, the religious leaders remembered. By the way, if you really were going to steal the body, don't you think it would be better that the tomb was unsecured and unguarded? Now, the very fact of the religious leaders going to Pilate and trying to figure out a way to secure the tomb and to provide a guard makes the story that people came and stole his body more plausible or less plausible? Less plausible. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus are clearly out of the closet. They are, in fact, his followers. They've taken the body. They buried the body. The religious leaders are thinking, wait a minute, are these guys co-conspirators in an elaborate hoax to get people to believe a lie? They ask for a guard or a watch. Some suggest that the number of soldiers may have been as few as four or as, as many as 16. Numbers have gone as high as 50 guards. However many are available, Pilate is in effect saying, you want to guard a dead man? Go ahead. Do your best. In a few years, Pilate's going to disappear from history. He is going to resign his position at procurator, and he's going to head for Gaul near Germany. According to legend, he is going to commit suicide somewhere near Switzerland, a place known for its neutrality. Can you imagine trying to find the one place on earth where you never have to make a decision, where you never have to take a side, where you never have to make a commitment. I want to ask you something. Are you afraid that Christ and Christianity might be one big, gigantic hoax? The religious leaders are going to take every precaution that the body that lays in the tomb stays in the tomb. Here's what they say. Seal it. Guard it. The body is in a cave hewn from solid rock. There's no time to dig a tunnel. There's no time to create an alternative entrance. The tomb was made secure by attaching a hemp cord to either side and then placing the Roman seal on either side. The statement, you have a guard, is quite ambiguous. It could mean, you have a guard, use what resources you have, or you have a guard, I'll give you a guard. That is, I will give you permission to post Roman soldiers and post a Roman seal. The guard may have consisted of the temple police and the Roman soldiers. But I want you to think again about what's happening. Solid rock, that'll keep the disciples out, right? 
a detachment of highly trained and skilled soldiers. That'll keep the disciples out, right? A Roman seal, broken or violated, would bring down the wrath of the entire Roman Empire and Roman resources so that they would hunt them down and kill them. So what are the skeptics afraid of? Jesus said he would come back to life. That's not what they're afraid of. They're afraid that the disciples are going to steal the body. And so the countermeasures make their claim move from the realm of the plausible to the realm of the impossible. We're, we're going to make sure you can't steal the body. Now, again, put yourself in this position. Now, what do you do if the body actually disappears? John Phillips writes, It seemed that death was reigning supreme, but try as it might, it could not corrupt the immortal clay lying swathed and bound in the inner darkness of the tomb. Heaven above and hell beneath watched that sepulcher with bated breath and angels gathered in the shadows. Again, the irony. The only way to get past the guard and get past the seal is a supernatural resurrection. Isn't this fun? We're going to get to have Easter all over again. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful for your love. Lord, I pray that in this time, Lord, you would help us to understand about death. That, Lord, you would prepare us to be men and women who not only love you and serve you, but that, Lord, we would come to grips with what we really, really believe about death. What we really, really believe happens when you die. What we really believe concerning Jesus. And so, Lord, again, if we live long enough, Lord, we know that there's going to come a time where we have to bury somebody that we love or somebody who loves us is going to have to bury us. Lord, what will we say? What will we do? How will we respond? How can we point people to the life that's just beyond the shadows. And Lord, again, we're reminded of what Jesus repeatedly said. If I die, I'm gonna come back to life. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. And he that believes in me, even if he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever lives, and believes in me will never die. There's never a time where, we, where our friendship or our, our fellowship has to be broken. And so, Lord, again, we pray that we could be men and women who provide comfort and hope. Lord, we pray that we would come out of the shadows and given the opportunity to do what's right, that that's exactly what we'll do. In Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead, Carolyn. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever be. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. And if we
the shadows it's time to come out of the darkness
it's time that you say in an unmistakable way that you know him and that you love him and that you want to serve him. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord fill your heart with courage. In Jesus' name.